So we're here at Nowcast SA Studios in the sixth floor of Central Library in San Antonio talking to David Hinojosa and Al Kaufman about the Texas Supreme Court ruling on school finance that came down recently. Um, Al Kaufman, who is now a, a law professor at St. Mary's University, filed the first school finance case in 1984 when he was an attorney for MALDEF, um, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. And David, who is now the director, uh, national director of policy at IDRA, um, IDRA is an equity based research and technical assistance nonprofit in San Antonio. Um, David filed the case that was just decided by the Supreme Court um, back in 2011 after the legislature cut $5 billion from school funding. So David, talk to us about what, what the court did. Well, what the court did was essentially uh, gut the constitutional rights of school children in the state of Texas to a quality education. Uh, it did this by um, uh, holding that the system was sufficiently funded uh, holding that the uh, gaps and the differences between funding for property poor versus property rich district, although substantial, were good enough uh, for the Texas Constitution. And unfortunately, it reversed the lower court ruling that held that the system otherwise wasn't meeting uh, the constitutional standards. And in the end, this means that the Supreme Court uh, lowered the constitutional floor of a basic adequate education into the basement and passed uh, the responsibility nearly wholly to the legislature to fix, if it cares to at all. If it cares to at all, because essentially the what the court said was it should be fixed, but they didn't make anybody required to do anything. Exactly. Right? Right. So let's go back to the beginning of this, um, back to 1984, and tell me what what this case is about and why it matters. Well, it's a history of Texas that the low wealth districts and minority children were badly treated in public education. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been struggles for many years. There was a U.S. Supreme Court case back in 1973 about school finance, but there was no real progress made. So in 1983-84, a group of low wealth districts and advocacy organizations got together and said, we have to go to court to force the legislature to do something because the legislature basically won't move because they were controlled by wealthy districts and by high by taxpayers and so they weren't going to take the action necessary so at the time the poor districts had about half as much as the wealthy districts in terms of providing for their students they had no funding for facilities um, they were terribly understaffed they had uncertified teachers they had buildings falling apart and they the people in those districts, as well as the communities all knew they had to deal with the situation. So that's why we brought the lawsuit. And it starts with, with Edgewood, right here in, in San Antonio. Edgewood was, was the, the, the poster child for this, for this case. Well, and Edgewood had been the leader. I mean, yeah. Edgewood was the, the leader in the federal court lawsuit back in 1973. And then Edgewood was the, I think, the leader of the poor school districts and the emotional leader as well of the efforts we did in 1984. The, the whole premise, the underlying premise is that when you, when you support, when you fund schools through property taxes, if the area that is funding the schools is comprised of not, not affluent people and not, not really um, uh, rich property, then it's very difficult to raise enough money. Well, that's right. And in Texas, there is a tremendous disparity between the poorest districts and the richest districts. Uh, a district like Edgewood had $20,000 of property for every student, and there were some very wealthy oil and gas districts that had $7 million of property for districts. So it was tremendous uh, variety. That wouldn't be so bad, except the state relied so much on that money to support the schools and then didn't supplement it enough to make up for the differences. So if Edgewood could raise one hundredth as much as the surrounding district for a certain tax rate, the state didn't do nearly enough to compensate for that to bring them up to the same levels. So the huge disparities in what, what districts were able to spend on per student, what they were able to spend on buildings, what they were able to spend on, on teachers, huge mm. disparities that the state was not willing to the state and, and ultimately all of us, the taxpayers and the people who vote or not vote, all of us together were the ones who created this situation too. 
So you filed the suit back in 1984, um, and some things improved? I think they did. In 1989, we won a major opinion, unanimous opinion of the Texas Supreme Court saying the system was unconstitutional. And in 19, in 1991, uh, uh, we won another one. And both of those were very strong decisions. They forced the legislature both to increase the funding and increase the equity of the system. They didn't solve it and they didn't go far enough, but they did make some improvements. And then, then comes 2011 and the legislature cut $5 billion in school funding? Yeah, it was funding from the overall funding that school districts were getting, as well as for specialized programs like pre-K programs, extended day programs, tutoring programs that really reach you know the child every day, especially underserved children like economically disadvantaged and poor children. And you know there was no other resort. You know the legislature had uh, pulled all of that money out, had raised the standards too, had it increased, uh, expected all students to graduate college and career ready, which was a good thing, a good, good move for the legislature. They had expanded testing, uh, high stakes testing graduation requirements from four to 15. And what else are uh, school districts and school children supposed to do except, you know, wallow in failure, but to you know, use the courts again, uh, because it has been that leverage point of the only real significant reforms that we've known in Texas, you know, dating back the last four decades. So, so when, when the legislature pulls $5 billion from, from public education funding, that shows up close and personal everywhere. Right? I mean, a absolutely. And it, and it wasn't just the property poor districts that were suing on this. Of course, because they were receiving significantly less money from the system already, it certainly meant a lot more to them. But, you know, class sizes increasing across the state, school districts having to uh, curtail uh, uh, extended day programs, summer school programs, um, uh, cutting back on their pre-kindergarten programs, a lot of these programs that really help target the needs of uh, English language learners and really help them meet, you know, the increasing state standards, those were having to be cut back. So it wasn't just the Edgewoods, it was the Dallas, it was the Houston's, it was the Austin ISDs, the El Paso ISDs, several districts, 600 plus 600 across the state, right, property right. rich, mid wealth districts and high wealth districts were all suing uh, because they were all hurting. Wow, wow. And, and, and we go back to the, the pre-K once again. I mean, we know for, for children who, for whom English is their first language, what pre-K coming to kindergarten, kinder ready means, and that means a much more higher likelihood of them reading at grade level in third grade, a much less lower likelihood of them dropping out in junior high school, a much higher likelihood of them graduating from high school. And for kids who need extra help, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, right? and, and we have an increasing number of English language learner students. They now make up nearly one out of every five students in the state of Texas. English language uh, learner is, uh, means for whom English is not their first language. Exactly, right. and, and they're not yet proficient in the English language right. itself. But uh, for economically disadvantaged students, those are now three out of every five students across the state of Texas. I mean, there were districts like Richardson ISD who are now majority low-income districts. And Richardson ISD in the Dallas area in the past has always been known as a very wealthy, uh, upper-class, majority Anglo, uh, majority high-income school district. So these, these impacts, these uh, demographic shifts in state that have been coming on you know, for the past couple of decades, but certainly even more so in the last decade have magnified you know, the challenges that students face. And this is a great opportunity for the state of Texas. I mean, this growing diversity, you, children who are learning the English language have the potential to be a bilingual student when they graduate. And instead, when you starve school districts, they starve the education that students are receiving because they have no other recourse. They can't meet the needs of those students. And they start fearing these students, unfortunately. They don't see their these students and their families largely as assets, unfortunately. They see them 
through more of a deficit, deficit mindset. But this is an incredible diversity. We have a lot of, you know, 60% of our kids are low income, but that shows you how, much, how resilient students can be also when they face those challenges uh, of putting food on the table uh, and getting ready, you know, for school and then uh, coming home. So, uh, again, you know, this is incredible opportunities that the state has, but unfortunately there's this huge disconnect between expectations, standards from the state, and the funding and resources and opportunities that they provide to school districts uh, so those children can access an education to succeed. Those changes have really uh, added to the chance to do something about this because when we filed this lawsuit back in the 80s, the low wealth districts had a variety of disadvantages. They had less money, less ability to raise money, they had more poor kids, they had more kids who were English language learners, higher cost in general, and they just suffered in every possible way. Now, because the, the populations, poor population, English language learners are larger and more distributed, other districts also have, have a, a dog in this fight and they have a real interest in it. That's one reason why we started. We started with nine school districts and now there's 600 districts involved in the lawsuits because I think they and their boards and their communities know that all of them need to get involved in this. Now the next step is to try to get all of that interest and focus and uh, into changing the legislature and changing the leadership in the state. But there is a much broader need and a, more broad, a much broader understanding of the issues now. I mean, and, then, and that's where we go. I mean, what, where do we go from here? I mean, you, you've been talking to school districts, you talk to school districts all the time, and the, the folks who were part of this lawsuit, now what? Well, it's gonna be uh, absolutely necessary that one, children and their families speak up, that they have a voice in this, because they can hold their own individual legislator accountable, they can hold their own individual school district accountable as well. Uh, and we're going to need a significant uptick in family and uh, parent and community engagement uh, to, to try and tackle this problem. Because, you know, what the, what the Supreme Court did say after reinventing this record and pretending that class size doesn't matter, pretending that money doesn't matter despite a robust record showing otherwise, um, what they did say was that things aren't good in Texas. We're saying this is constitutional, but constitutional is not good enough for the state of Texas and legislature. It's your responsibility to fix this and provide a quality education for all students. So the first thing is, of course, you know, trying to engage parents and students on this issue. But secondly, it also is going to require incredible effort to have property wealthy and property poor and mid-wealth districts all come together and get in the same boat. For years, property wealthy districts have refused to invite other districts onto their ocean liner and said, your tugboat is well enough. Well, they haven't made you know, the kind of inroads they need on Texas policy uh, through that approach. And we have you know, these pro-equity and anti-equity groups. Uh, they need to realize that if we need to build a robust system, especially with this legislature, who is not always kind to opportunity for all uh, to take any action in the upcoming session, they're going to have to come on the same boat. They're going to have to come together, put aside their differences, quit trying to extend the equity gap between the wealthy and the poor. And if they all come together again, you're not talking about just 600 districts. You're talking about all 1,024 school districts and their 5.5 million school children and families. How many there are? It's and, and it's going to take some. It's going to take some leadership on that. I mean, some some leadership from from somewhere. Well, it's going to take some leadership, and I mean that that has to start with the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the speaker of the house have to be committed to this and have to say not just that. Well, we can't afford to do everything. We have to lower taxes, but say the future of this state is educating these kids. And the only way that Texas is going to be able to compete nationally and internationally is to have a better educated workforce. And we're, we're very low in expenditures for the, compared to the rest of the country. We have greater needs than most other states. 
and the leadership is going to have to bite the bullet and do that. And of course, all of us need to uh, talk to the legislators and the, the leadership persuade and persuade them. <laughs> persuade, that's a very nice word, but I mean, I, I think we need to persuade them to do this. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that they understand that the political consequences of inaction will be very negative for them. Yeah, and, and, the, and the Texas Supreme Court, you know, they did essentially, they changed the law in this case. They, they, they changed the standard. We knew what the target was going in, and we uh, tried and proved, you know, those claims against the standards that the Supreme Court has set before. But while they can change the law, they can't change the facts. And the fact is, is that we have 68% of Latino students in the state of Texas who are not achieving the state's own low standard for college readiness. We have more than 50% of the kids across the state who are graduating not college and career ready. 72% of African American students graduating mm -hmm. are not college ready according to the lower standard the state itself has set. And the Supreme Court did say that we need to bring the school finance system into the 21st century. Apparently that's not necessarily what the Constitution somehow requires. It's frozen back in time, but they did say that we need to do that. So there are some real critical elements that need to be updated in our school finance system, parts that haven't been updated since the 1980s. How antiquated is that, given our changing times, needs, and expectations? Uh, and it's going to be critical that you know all of this effort be to hold the legislature uh, accountable uh, for its actions. So. Um you just spoke to a school district, and, and what did what did you tell them that they their next steps are? What um, for teachers, for administrators, um, parents? What well, are their next steps? Sure, and and it's to continue to try and provide the best opportunities that they are doing because there's a mm -hmm. lot. There's thousands of schools across Texas that are trying to make do with what they have, and they're not going to stop trying to make do with that. But they're going to have to get their parents organized. They're going to have to reach out and educate their communities and their legislators on this issue and let them know how parents are impacted. I mean, in the case we had a, uh, a parent who was in a property poor district in Pasadena and then she did a little bit better income wise and they moved to Clear Creek, which was just basically across the side of the tracks in the Houston area. And she saw the differences between no science experiments, between having to t take paper to her school for her kids to use for copying paper, not having access to textbooks, not having access to uh, tutoring, to having all of those things plus so much more enrichment across the tracks just because they were in Clear Creek and no longer in Pasadena. I mean, those kind of injustices we should not be talking about, especially because we hold all children uh, to the same standards. Their record in this case, by the way, as a, as a lawyer and professor, I did the first case, but in this case, they developed the most complete and impressive record ever in Texas school finance. I mean, they showed the disparities. They showed how they met all of the legal standards as never has been, been done before. But this long-term uh, goal of improving the education in the state, I just can't stress it too much how important it is. I mean, the, the only way the state will improve is is to put in that extra funding or to use the funds that they have more effectively. One of the things that bothered me most about the decision, there are many things that did, but one of them bothered me was they act, they talked about how the disparities between rich and poor are about the same as they were before and they're not so much worse, but they've always been bad and there have always been disparities and the low wealth districts have always had less and always needed more and they never have solved that. Mm -hmm. And they talk about the different districts here in Texas. In my own experience, we educated our kids in public schools here in Texas, and then we moved to a Boston suburb, and then we moved to a San Francisco suburb. And there's simply no comparison between what Texas could offer and what those other districts could offer. Mm -hmm. They just were richer, they had a smaller classes, they had better qualified teachers, they had more, more robust programs, they had better special ed programs. The fact is, for that additional funding, which they spend, they got a lot, and it was a much better education for our children. So there, so there are some easy, not easy, but there are models out there to look to for how this can be done. Yeah. I mean, and there are solutions. School finance is an incredibly complex. I mean, mm -hmm. I've always said that we need to find some other word other than school finance. <laughs> uh, but um, if we 
want to focus on you know fair funding for all school children and bring this system into the tra uh, into the 21st century there's two really basic things that the legislature could do not necessarily the only things they should do but what they can do and one is to increase the basic allotment that's the basic funding that uh, school districts receive and raise that up and also uh, increase the weights or the cost adjustments the extra cost that the state gives for economically disadvantaged and English learner students because they do need you know access to additional programs often to help them meet the same standards and help them meet their own uh, potential and so just by updating the, the basic allotment by updating the uh, weights for bilingual education and compensatory education that's for the low-income students we can go a long way uh, just by those two core pieces. And as you were saying, that's not just in Edgewood. Now it, it will yeah. have an effect in wealthy school districts yeah. like Austin? Like Austin ISD, uh, like Houston ISD, like Northside here in San Antonio, like Northeast in San Antonio, even you know school districts like Bernie uh, in, the, in this area, uh, and Richardson you know, in the Dallas area. Mm -hmm. Virtually every district across the state of Texas would benefit one way or another from those two core reform measures. And so um, what, what stands between now and making that happen is for members of the Texas legislature and the Texas leadership to believe that the constituency, their voters, voters care about this. A a absolutely. absolutely, that's what's needed. It's not just you know the legislature, like what Al said. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the governor, it's the lieutenant governor. They seem to have other ideas. They're actually happy that the Supreme Court ruling held that the system was minimally constitutional. What they don't understand that there's a huge gap between what a quality education is in Texas and what a constitutionally adequate education is in Texas. Right, right. And, and what that means for the future of the state. Well, are we going to invest in the children who are going to be our future, you know, so that we can cut down on certain costs, which would include uh, crime, which it would include uh, welfare, uh, potentially, uh, in those areas. And just at its basic core, just provide what the district what the schools and the state should be providing to children to help them achieve their full potential. That shouldn't be too much to ask for because if we don't, again, we're talking about 60% of these children and that rate is growing. We're talking about one out of every five students who's an English learner nearly uh, in our state. And you know the consequences are, are, are gonna be innumerable. Mm -hmm. if we don't. To some extent, the Supreme Court opinion could have called the bluff of the leadership in the legislature. They've often said the court should stay out of this. We, the legislature, know what's best for Texas. We can handle it. And the leadership has said the court should stay out of it. We're the leadership. We can do. We're elected statewide. We know what we need for Texas. Well, now the court's out of it. So now they're going to have to do it. Let's see. They, they blamed a lot of it on, well, we can't do it because we never know what the court's going to do. We can't do this because we never know what the court's going to do. Well, now the court has basically said, we're not going to deal with it anymore. You, the leadership, have to deal with it, and we'll see what happens now. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and a Band-Aid's not going to suffice this time. I mean, you know, the, the schools are in crisis mode. They're hemorrhaging, and a Band-Aid is not going to fix, you know, this kind of wound. Uh, it's going to take, you know, significant... Uh, work on behalf of the legislature uh, to make sure that you know opportunities provided to all. I think the the uh, line from the decision was a band aid on top of a band aid. That's right. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But there was a lot of nice language in there. There's just no good opinion there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it, and um, we can come back and revisit in the future. Yes, thank we can. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.